so bad, though. No, it's <laughs> yes. I mean, that's pretty bad. It's just nothing. I feel like it's uh, only like three minutes. Okay, like. so topic. This is where we listen to the Venerable Bhante talk about Buddhism. <laughs> Okay, so now we come to verse number six in the Uraga Sutta. Okay, so first I'll recite in Pali, and then you recite each phrase after me. Yas antarato. Yas antarato. Nasanti Kopa. Nasanti Kopa. Iti Bhava Bhava Tancha. Iti Bhava Bhava Tancha. Viti Vato. Viti Vato. So Bhikkhu Jahati Ora Param. So Bhikkhu Jahati Ora Param. Ora Go Jinamiva Tachang. Puranan. Urago Jinamiva Tacham Puranan. And then the translation One who has no irritations inwardly, having transcended such and such states of existence, that monk gives up the here and the beyond as a serpent sheds its old worn out skin. Okay, so the key words here in the first line the word is kopa and yeah. So I consulted the dictionary of Pali to get the meanings of this and it gives as meanings irritation, agitation, anger. So it's a little bit similar to the defilement of anger that we had in the first verse, koda, where the word was koda. But I think kopa suggests more the sense of that which sort of erupts or breaks up, breaks out, which bubbles up. So I think it could have a somewhat broader meaning than coda. Coda is always exclusively anger. But kopa could indicate any kind of mental irritation or agitation, disturbance, distress. I think, if I remember, the commentary didn't comment on kopa, just taking its meaning as evident to the reader. Okay, then in the second line, we have the phrase that I had translated, such and such states of existence. And here I actually differ from the commentary. Okay. So the Pali here is bhav abhava. Abstract would be bhav abhava ta. Okay, now the commentary is taking this as a combination of bhava, which means existence, plus abhava, which means non existence literally existence and non-existence and therefore it equates above with vibhava 
and it explains the two words in this way. It takes bhava to be success, the bhava, which it's, it's offering as an alternative to a bhava, the bhava as failure. It, so that's one polarity or dichotomy that it offers. Then it says, so too, bhava is progress, vibhava is decline, bhava is the view of eternal existence, eternalism, whereas vibhava is the view of annihilation, annihilation, annihilationism, bhava is merit, and vibhava is evil. And then it says that one, one referred to in the sutta, has transcended these pairs of opposites by the fit four paths. Those are the four stages of realization in a fitting way. Okay, that's the commentary, but I've relied on a note by the British Pali scholar K. R. Norman, who explains he takes The ah here is just a rhythmical lengthening so that the real meaning would be bhava bhava, just existence after existence, and that A is lengthened just for rhythmical purposes. A rather technical linguistic point. Okay, so we have this word kupa, and then this is actually ties in, in a way, significantly with the state of arhatship, with the attainment of arhatship is sometimes described as the kupa cheto vimuti. Now, akupa. This is getting too linguistically technical. <laughs> okay, so the verb from which kopa is derived, the verbal root is koop, and <laughs> like a chicken koop. <laughs> and so it would be the verb kupati, which means to become irritated or to become agitated or to become shaken. That's a good, good rendering. And then from this verb we get a grammatical form of a word kupa which would mean shakeable, that which can be shaken, that which can be disturbed. And so akupa cheto vimuti is the liberation of mind that is unshakable, that cannot be undermined, overturned, or disturbed in any way. And this is the liberation of mind achieved with the attainment of arhatsha. So it's sometimes said when the Buddha or a disciple has achieved arhatsha, they say that they've achieved the akupa cheto vimuti, the unshakable or imperturbable liberation of mind. And so here I've taken a passage which speaks of how the liberated one is imperturbable. Yeah, this is from the Anguttara Nikaya. This is the monk named Sona, who has just become an arhat, and then he comes to the Buddha and he says, when a monk is an arhat, perfectly liberated in mind, if very powerful sort of forms, like overwhelming forms, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile objects or mental objects come into range of his senses, his mind is not obsessed by them, 
His mind is not at all mixed up with them, but his mind remains steady, attained to imperturbability, and he observes its vanishing. Okay, and then I took another passage to illustrate this. Which shows how a disciple remains unshaken by the what is called the pairs of worldly opposites, or the loka dhamma, the worldly states. So the pairs of worldly opposites are gain and loss. So people want gain or profit, and they're distressed by loss. The next pair is fame and infamy or disrepute. So people are elated by fame and then when their reputation is overturned then they fall into disrepute, then they become dejected. And then people but normally elated by praise and dejected by blame and criticism. And people are elated by pleasure and dejected by pain. And so here the Sutta explains how the disciple remains balanced and imperturbable amongst these pairs of worldly opposites. So when he comes upon gain, gains some material asset that he wants, he reflects on it thus, the gain that has come to me is impermanent, it's dukkha, like not fully, not necessarily bound up with suffering, but it's unsatisfactory, not fully, satisfac fully satisfying, and it's subject to change. And so he reflects upon me in the same way when he undergoes loss, so you lose things that are beloved and desirable, and then you reflect that this loss is impermanent. Of course, as a loss, it's dukkha, it's not satisfying, and it's subject to change. So this you could, one could apply in daily life. So when God, guess what one wants? Instead of getting really excited, oh, I'm so excited, so happy, so enthusiastic and joyful. Of course, when you, if you get something that's really fulfilling, you could experience satisfaction on that account. But then also bear in mind that what you've gained is impermanent, can change, can vanish. And then when it vanishes, if it does happen, then you can maintain equanimity. Similarly, <clears throat> okay, if fame comes, everybody knows your name and says, oh, how wonderful you are, and so on. Instead of getting elated, you reflect this fame <laughs> is impermanent, <laughs> subject to change. And then also, I mean, if you fall into disrepute because you've really done bad things and sort of the word has gotten out, this happens to famous movie actors or even evangelical preachers from time to time. Um, so if you, then that should be an occasion for the person to reflect back on their conduct and to change their conduct. But if the disrepute is just because people have been spreading bad, untrue rumors and now in the age of the internet with Facebook and email, sometimes false rumors can spread widely and cause a person of good conduct to become subject to disrepute, just reflect again that this is impermanent, subject to change. In fact, there's a little story, it's from the Rinzai Zen tradition, 
maybe that illustrates this. In Japan, there was a famous Zen master named Hakuen, who was living in the monastery. And there was, in the village down below, there was a girl who was having a relationship with a young fisherman, and she got pregnant as a result of her the relationship. And then when her parents saw her belly in, becoming enlarged, they blamed her, and then they asked her, who was the one who got you pregnant? And she didn't want to get her boyfriend in trouble, and she was really agitated. So she pointed up to the monastery, and she said, it was the Zen master, Hakuen. So the parents were upset by this, and then when the baby was born, they took the baby and brought it up to Hakuen and said, you got our daughter pregnant, this is your baby, you take care of it. And Hakuen just shook his head and said, is that so, is that so? <laughs> And he took the baby <laughs> and looked after the baby. And then after a few days, the girl was stricken by a sense of guilt. and was thinking, oh, what have I done? I've gotten that innocent Zen master in trouble. Really, I shouldn't have done that. Maybe she was having bad dreams and seeing in her dreams, demons coming to torment her. So she couldn't keep it in any longer. And so she called her parents and said, I have to confess to you that I told a lie. Hakuen has nothing to do with the baby. It was the fisherman's son. <clears throat> and so then the parents went up to the monastery <laughs> And they said to Hakuen, Oh, Venerable One, please, please accept our apology. We're so sorry that we railed against you and criticized you so harshly. Our daughter has told us that you had nothing to do with the baby. It was really the fisherman's son. So we'll take the baby back. <laughs> and Hakuen stood there and said, well, he went, he got the baby, brought it and gave it to the parents, and he just said to the parents, Is that so? <laughs> Is that so? <laughs> okay, so that's an example of remaining <laughs> unfazed, unagitated in the face of... This would be praise and blame, or fame and disrepute. And then... The fourth pair is pleasure and pain. So when one experiences pleasure, then one doesn't become attached to it and elated by it. And when one experiences pain, one doesn't become dejected and downcast because of that. Here the text goes on to say, having given up likes and dislikes, the disciple is freed from birth, aging and death, and so on. In, in other words, indicating the attainment of our hardship, but I think even at more basic levels of practice, like this isn't exclusive to the arhat, but just in our daily life, when we meet these pairs of worldly opposites, we can use this kind of reflection in order to maintain a balanced mind, a mind that is not elated and not cast down. Okay, so these, I just had these two passages for this verse. And now we'll go to the next verse, and then after this, then I'll ask for questions. So we come to verse number seven. And so reading the Pali together. Yasa vitaka vitupita Ajatang suvi kapita asesa. 
So Bhikkhu Jahati, O Raparam. So Bhikkhu Jahati, O Raparam. Urago Jinamiva. Urago Jinamiva. Tachang Puranam. Tachang Puranam. And then the translation is one whose thoughts have been burnt out, entirely removed internally. That monk gives up the here and the beyond as a serpent sheds its old, worn-out skin. So if you read this, and take it literally, or just read it superficially, it seems that what, when you attain enlightenment, that all thoughts whatsoever are entirely eliminated, completely, as the text says, suvi kapita, well, entirely well removed. And so you think the enlightened person has no thoughts, whatsoever, just always remaining in a thought-free state. But that's not the case. And so here I would agree with the commentary. What the commentary says is that what is meant here by vitaka are unwholesome thoughts. And so here I brought in a number of suttas which speak about the overcoming the training for overcoming unwholesome thoughts. And usually the texts classify the unwholesome thoughts as they mention three primary types. So the three primary types are thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will, anger or resentment, and the thought of harming thought of aggression towards others, or perhaps towards oneself and, and or others. And so here the text says that the monk, reflecting wisely, does not tolerate an arisen thought of sensual desire. He abandons it, removes it, does away with it, and dispels it. He does not tolerate an arisen thought of ill will, an arisen thought of harming, he does not tolerate any other arisen, unwholesome thoughts, and he abandons them, removes them, does away with them, and dispels them. And just if we look at this, it seems that the way to deal with the unwholesome thoughts is to forcefully get rid of them, to drive them out. But as we'll see, as I think I have this in a later passage just below, there are actually various ways of dealing with the unwholesome thoughts. And usually the Buddha gives preference to what I would call the gentler ways, and that the more forceful ways come only later when the gentler, softer ways turn out not to be effective. But here, I next brought in a passage in which the Buddha shows how he dealt with unwholesome thoughts when he was training for enlightenment. So he's speaking to the period, this is the period when he's entered on the noble quest, but it's still before his enlightenment. He says, while I was still an enlightened, unenlightened bodhisattva, then he considered, let me divide my thoughts into two classes. And so then he says, on one side, I put the unwholesome thoughts thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will, thoughts of harming, and then, so those are the unwholesome class. And on the other side, I put thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of goodwill, and thoughts of non-harming. And then he said, as he was dwelling thus, from time to time, a thought of sensual desire would arise in me. So you see, even the the Buddha as a bodhisattva, not perfect, he's 
sensual thoughts will arise, the other thoughts will arise. And then the Buddha used what we would call wise reflection in order to gain insight into these unwholesome thoughts and thereby to cause them to subside. So he would reflect that this thought of sensual desire that has arisen, this leads to my own affliction, it's troublesome to myself, then if I were to act on it, it would lead to the affliction of others, and thereby it would lead to the affliction of both. And then more incisively, he reflects that this thought of sensual desire is obstructive to wisdom. So it prevents the unfolding and development of wisdom. It causes difficulties and inner distress and it leads away from his goal, from Nibbana. So when, he says, when I reflected in each of these ways, that thought subsided. And so then, because he had examined these thoughts and saw the drawback, disadvantage, or danger in those thoughts, then he says, whenever a sensual thought would arise in me, I abandoned it, removed it, dispelled it. And then he applied the same method of reflection in regard to when a thought of ill will would arise. Perhaps he was thinking back memories of the days in the palace with David Datta as the troublemaker. And then even a thought of harming, a thought of injuring Others. It seems a bit strange in the great compassionate Bodhisattva, but this is what the text says. So he applied, in each case, that line of reflection, and just by reflecting in that way and seeing that this thought is a source of trouble and an obstacle to the pursuit of one's ultimate goal, the thought subsides. And then he says the same, actually I didn't include that passage, but he applies this similar reflection when the wholesome thoughts arise, the thought of renunciation, which is the opposite of sensual desire, the thought of goodwill, which is the antidote to ill will, and the thought of non-harming, this is the thought of ahingsa, which is the opposite of the thought of harming or hingsa. He would reflect that this thought is causes no affliction for myself, no affliction for others, no affliction for both. This thought is conducive to wisdom, removes difficulties and leads to Nibbana. And so the, then the Buddha says, whatever you frequently think about that becomes the inclination of the mind. So, even if like, you don't have that inclination to renunciation, but if you reflect on the benefits of renunciation, then gradually the mind will incline towards renunciation. Similarly, if you frequently think thoughts of goodwill, if you generate metta, even though you don't immediately feel the great loving-kindness for others, but if you engage in that practice, generating the thoughts, may they be well, may they be happy, may they be free from harm and suffering, then through that practice, that becomes the inclination of the mind. And then the actual feeling of goodwill or metta will arise naturally and more spontaneously. And then similarly, if you frequently think thoughts of non-harming, or in this case maybe thoughts of compassion, then you will abandon the thought of harming to cultivate the thought of non-harming. And then that thought of non-harming or the thought of compassion becomes the inclination of the mind. So this is in effect what we're doing in mind training 
our minds for, we would say, through a beginningless time, have been rolling in the tracks of sensual desire, ill will, harming, and in other unwholesome, the tracks of other unwholesome thoughts. And what we do is say, wait a minute, don't go, don't continue going down that road, there's another road you can take. And so we turn the steering wheel of the mind around, we reverse direction, and we get on to this other road, the road of thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of goodwill or kindness, thoughts of compassion, and we direct our mind down that road, and then little by little the mind becomes familiar with that road and can move in that direction more and more easily. Okay, here I have a sutta on five ways of removing unwholesome thoughts. So here the Buddha is speaking to the monks and he's saying, to monks who are engaged in meditation practice, aiming for samadhi, and so he says, when you are giving attention to some meditation object, and owing to that object, there arise unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, hate, or with delusion. Okay, the first method is to give attention, to switch <coughs> objects, or to switch the subject of meditation, and instead direct the attention to some other object connected with the wholesome that can function as the antidote to the unwholesome thought. And so if, say, thoughts of anger and ill will arise, then one develops the antidote to that, which would be the meditation on loving-kindness. If thoughts of sensual desire arise, then one might turn the attention to the 32 parts of the body. If the mind becomes, say, grim and dejected and dark, then one turns to some object that gives joy. Often mentioned as a joyful object is the Buddha Nusati, the recollection of the qualities of the Buddha. Okay, so this is using one meditation object to knock out the unwholesome thought, an object that is the opposite or the antidote to the unwholesome thought. Okay, the second method is to examine the danger in those thoughts. So when reflects that these thoughts are unwholesome, they lead away from the goal, they will drag me down, or run over the mind and dominate the mind and cause unwholesome karma to, for, cause me to create unwholesome karma. So in this way, by reflecting on the danger or the drawback in those thoughts, then one causes those thoughts to subside. That's the method that the Buddha himself used in this process of reflection. Okay, the third method is like this is the opposite of mindfulness, <laughs> in a sense, that you don't pay attention to those thoughts. Don't let them continue to arise. Don't indulge those thoughts, but just keep your mind on the primary object. Then the fourth method is to gradually stop the formation of those thoughts. And I've always found this something of an enigma, exactly what is meant by this. And what the way I would apply this is that the mind is engaging or stirring up and churning out these unwholesome thoughts. So what one does then is to turn the attention back onto the mind itself and just observe the mind. This is a method that I explained earlier in response to the question. And just watch the mind and then you see that these thoughts are arising in the mind. But as one goes on watching the thoughts, those thoughts 
start to diminish, diminish, diminish until they just break off and they're gone. Okay, and then if none of these methods work, then the Buddha says, <laughs> in that case, you should clench, maybe speaking a little metaphorically here, you clench your teeth, press your tongue against the roof of your mouth, and literally it's you beat down your mind, a mind, and I explain this, you beat down the mind by mental determination. And he illustrates this, he uses a simile to illustrate this. It's just as if a strong man <laughs> were to grab hold of a weak man and throw him down to the ground <laughs> and then press him down on the ground. <laughs> and then he goes on, by using these methods, unwholesome thoughts are abandoned and then the mind becomes internally stabilized, composed, unified and concentrated. In that way you become the master of your thoughts and whatever thought you want to think, you will think and you won't think the thoughts that you don't want to think. Okay, so this is the way of eliminating unwholesome thoughts. Actually there's another passage here but I've already dealt enough with that theme. And now the Sutta has spoken about eliminating thoughts internally and there is a, a state or a series of states in which there are no thoughts. So this is a state of samadhi in which one overcomes the taka and the chara, the discursive thought and examination. And so here the Buddha speaks about three kinds of concentration. So there's concentration with thought and with examination in Pali, with vitaka and with vichara. This would be the first jhana, the first absorption. Okay, then he says that there's a concentration without vitaka. Vitaka is the would be the applied thought, the factor that applies the mind to the object, but there's still the examination of the object, but without thought. And interestingly enough, there is no state in the sequence of jhanas that corresponds to this. So in the Abhidhamma system, the Abhidhamma system introduces five jhanas in which this becomes the second jhana. Okay, then the third concentration is concentration without thought and without examination. The state in which vitaka and vichara are both gone. And this is the concentration of the second jhana and the absorptions higher than or beyond the second jhana. Because they're both applied thought and examination have been gone, are gone. And then here I've taken a sutta in which a monk named Subhuti is sitting near the Buddha and the text says he's entered upon a thought-free state of concentration and then the Buddha sees him and then he speaks this utterance. He says, one whose thoughts have been burnt out entirely well removed internally. It's the same two lines as in this verse from the Uraga Sutta. But then the Buddha goes on, who has passed beyond the tie, perceiving the formless, overcoming the four bonds, the four bonds of sensual desire, craving for existence, views and ignorance, he never returns. So this, in this case, Subhuti would probably have been absorbed as an Arahat, he might have been absorbed in a formless absorption. And so the Buddha praises him in this way. Oops.
Okay, so that takes care of. There's the, I took brought in the Udana commentary here, but we don't have to go through that. Okay, so that takes care now of my explanation of verse number seven. So maybe. Maybe we could take some questions, maybe 10, 15 minutes of questions, and then we could conclude with the loving kindness meditation. Yeah, please. Uh, I, I want to look a bit more closely at this word, Vidhupita. So I seem to recall that Dhupa can mean smoke. Yeah, fire. yeah, that is also in another meaning. Yeah. So, like, I've seen places where fire is called Vidhupa, like a, a smokeless yeah. fire. Yeah. Um, so then, uh, so when I first saw this, yeah. line, that was what immediately came to my mind, like, yeah. um, thoughts like a smokeless fire. So then smoke then possibly being a metaphor for defilements, like smoke being dirty yeah. and filthy. Yeah. Yeah. So like a clean fire gives off no smoke. Yeah. Um, a dirty fire gives off smoke. Yeah. So that that's the imagery which came to mind, rather yeah. than burned out, meaning no fire at all. Yeah. Um, but rather uh, something in a completely clean, clean mind. Yeah, that's a, another possible, an interesting way to take it. We'd have to examine the Jupiter and see how it's used in other places, in other contexts. Okay. Yeah? How does one recognize the Buddha properly, and then how does one recognize the David properly? <laughs> okay, I have quite a lot of experience with recollection of the Buddha. Recollection of the Davids, I know it from the text, but I've never actually done it. Okay, recollection of the Buddha, the way I've explained it, is by is the formula for the nine, they call the nine epithets or nine qualities of the Buddha. And so first one has to get acquainted with the meaning and implications of those epithets. Yeah. That's what I've been wondering about. Yeah. So the Visuddhi Magga, the path of purification, has a a part of the chapter on the recollection of the Buddha, and then it explains, sometimes a little playfully, the meanings of these terms. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I have that file, but I had taught this last year, and I'm going to teach it again next week, and I had just a little, prepared a little file where I just took the essential meaning of each of the, t- of the epithets. If I could find it, I could make it available in some form. Okay, so, excuse me? I'd love to read it. Yeah. And so, one gets familiar with what I call the the flavor of each of those epithets. And then one goes through them, sort of mindfully, sort of bringing each one to mind, and then sort of turning it over in the mind for a couple of minutes then passes on to the next. And so then one goes through all nine, then one goes back to the beginning, goes through all nine again, goes through all nine, until one gets you know, well acquainted with the meaning and flavor of the nine epithets. Then what I found to be useful is that once you get acquainted with the nine, of those nine, certain ones will sort of make a stronger impact on the mind than others, give some inspiration, some joy. And so after going through the nine, one chooses three and lets the other six drop off and then just turns those three over and over in the mind. And then in the last stage of the three, one could choose just one and then just turn that one over and over in the mind. All right, because I was using like you know, the part that I knew of, which is pure. I couldn't remember the other eight, and then I remembered uh, that he had, he has overcome every pleasure and pain. So I always think I can get through this.
you know, Trent said, there's nothing that's truly permanent. Yeah. Then, so, but in the suttas, like, especially, you know, like, there's, like, a lot of the suttas, there's, like, there's the Amitabha Buddha, and there's, like, you know, the Buddha as we know, and there's, like, actually countless, like, Buddhas, where they're each characteristic and traits. Yeah. And there's the, the Mahayana, like, Buddhist Java, is, like, that's also present in other traditions. So if, like, they, by overcoming the four bonds that the minds literally never returns, like, why, why is that they are always, like, illuminating light? Why is there always? Why are they always, like, illuminating light, like, help uh, liberate other beings? Isn't that a kind of, I don't, which I don't understand, it's like, yeah. isn't that a sort of a desire to, like, liberate beings? It's like, if you're yeah. just, like, there, liberated, yeah. Why? Yeah. Like, why this, you this have, I, like, inclination to like just how like, yeah. other Okay. This idea of Buddhas existing uh-huh. maybe eternally or forever in other Buddha realms uh-huh. and sending down emanations uh-huh. in some way into the human realm out of compassion that comes in the later Mahayana sutras. So I'm sort of speaking on the basis of the Pali Nikayas, in which we don't find concepts like that. So the Buddha, the historical Buddha, the Buddha Gautama, out of compassion, accepted the request of the Mahabrahma to teach the Dhamma. And so he came, and out of compassion, he taught the Dhamma through the 45 years of his, the rest of his lifespan. And then he passed away into the final Nirvana element, but it seems maybe that there is, this is what Venerable Yinshun, the great uh, Chinese Buddhist scholar said, that after the Buddha's passing in the Buddhist community, there was this kind of strong, eternal nostalgia for the Buddha. <laughs> and so it is out of that nostalgia or that longing for personal contact with the Buddha, the idea eventually emerged of other Buddha realms or other realms in which the Buddha, other Buddhas are existing and then through the power of one's meditation one can see those Buddhas in the other realms, the other Buddha realms. But that is a a later development. Yes? Um, My question is, how does one eliminate um, unwholesome traits um, that is not aware of. So, for example, if I'm aware of being an angry person, I can do something about it. But yeah. if I am completely unaware of being an angry person, yeah. how can I actually um, act upon it? Then it's difficult. <laughs> 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 this is why the, in the Dhammapada, the Buddha says that. Um, I think the verse goes something like, if one finds a noble friend who points out one's faults and reproaches you for your faults, you should follow that person just as you would follow one who points out hidden treasures. (laughs) Because we all have sort of certain faults, shortcomings, defilements that we don't see, that we're not aware of. And so, it's always good to have Kalyana Mita's good friends who will point them out, point these faults out with a kind and compassionate mind and thereby help us to see them for ourselves and thus take the task of working on them. Thank you. What about a And also, just you know, one other sort of follow-up on that, is that maybe this is one of the reasons why the Buddha, rather than follow the model sort of previous Indian ascetic model of ascetics who just go off by themselves and live completely in seclusion. He established the a sangha, a community of people who live together and thereby, you know, living in a society, a community, is the most difficult challenge. <laughs> and so in that way, faults that would, if you were living alone, that would remain hidden or sort of suppressed, come out into the open. 
That makes sense. Yeah. Um, what about uh, cultural conditioning? Um, so my question is related to the previous question. Um, so, for example, an, enli uh, an enlightened being, um, once he becomes enlightened, would he actually become aware of cultural conditioning um, that clearly he was not aware of prior to, <laughs> um, such as, so it's kind of, I'm becoming a um, Does that make sense? Like The question makes sense. And it's a good question. I don't know, have a definite answer to that, <laughs> or authoritative answer. I would think maybe if one becomes, maybe even not even necessarily becoming enlightened, but just becoming extremely mindful, one could be aware of certain types of cultural conditioning that direct one in an unwholesome direction, or that uh, uh, sort of push one in an unwholesome direction. So that, I think, with enough mindfulness and also with feedback maybe from others, one could be aware of that kind of conditioning. But there might be broader types of cultural conditioning that we don't become aware of just because we're so immersed in the culture. Maybe even the Buddhist texts are coming out from a kind of cultural conditioning that, you know, that just enveloped you know, the compilers of the text from that of that period. Okay, so they are not, so cultural conditioning would not then be a form of delusion, right? Because um, otherwise an enlightened being would be free of delusion, hence free of cultural conditioning. I'm getting it in uh, <laughs> my stream of thought. <laughs> Yeah, it's just because I'm, like when I think of um, in more... Okay, maybe so, taking some <laughs> cultural conditioning from the text. <laughs> and this is something that continues in most Buddhist traditions. Okay, this, this is coming out from ancient India. Okay, so, please look at it <laughs> with me. Okay, like, in the lineup for meals and... Uh, monastic communities where there are both monks and nuns. <laughs> it's just taken for granted. <laughs> the monks go first and even the little monk is there ahead of the elder nuns. Mm -hmm. So that is a kind of cultural conditioning and in most like Asian Buddhist communities unless they've been impacted by the message coming from modern Western culture, they don't see any problem with that. You know, and like, we find problems with that. For me, it's more like uh, an enlightened being, being in that situation. So, let's say, not to name names, for example, Ajahn Chah, the, once he, he's known, well, reputed to be enlightened anyway. Yeah. Um, so, someone like Ajahn Chah or Mahabua, whoever, yeah. um, is somewhat recent to these days. Being in that circumstance, would he understand that is cultural conditioning, or would he just not see any, any problem with it? Actually, they might, in fact, they probably see this as cultural conditioning, but then they think, like, this is a kind of acceptable cultural conditioning. Because this is just the way the society that they're familiar with is, or, or the culture that they're familiar with is ordered, that the males have priority. But now, if we bring that into the, you know, into the West, then it creates some degree of dissonance. And so, when some Western monastic communities are working out, trying to work out ways to to re to rectify that or to change it in a way which is more in harmony with contemporary Western culture. All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah. you answered one question. For that example, wouldn't I... Can you, excuse me? For that example that you just gave of monks lining up before nuns for a meal time, yeah. like, personally I would see the hypocrisy in it less about the gender and more about no longer following the, um, like, whoever's been ordained the longest would go first. Like, wouldn't that come before gender at all? Well, there's a certain problem there. 
that it, there's a sort of understood principle, this is in traditional master, uh, uh, monasticism, that the principle of like, showing respect based on seniority applies within, amongst the monks within their own community and amongst the nuns within their own community. But when it comes to social functions, where they, they come together, then maybe the idea is that because the, monk, the order of monks was created first, so the monks take priority, like in the lineup, <laughs> and then the nuns come afterwards. So, my understanding that it's really that there's two separate communities that live in coexistence versus one community. In that there's a community of monks and maybe a community of nuns, but they're not necessarily a community of themselves together. That they're not necessarily... Okay. Oh, a community of themselves. There are two communities well, existing in harmony. Well, it could... There are different arrangements. In many cases, there'll be just, say, monasteries with monks only, and then there could be monasteries with nuns only. But I know in Sri Lanka there are some monasteries in which there are like two sections. And so there's the section for the monks, the section for the nuns, and generally there won't be like social interaction between them, but there'll be like the nuns will come to the senior monks for guidance. Um, yeah, and then occasionally there might be something like what they call a sanghi kadana, that's an offering to the sangha, in which both the monks and nuns will be present at the offering. But then, as I said, the monks will go line up first, and then the nuns will follow after the monks. And so if that's an established tradition, and as Buddhism comes to the West, it's probably, and then perhaps even as it bounces back to Asia, there can be changes. Um, is there a case where a, newly or, a more newly ordained monk would go to a senior nun for guidance? That is happening in the West, actually. In fact, I know of some cases there was Ayakema, a German nun. So according to the Vinaya, she can't ordain... The nun cannot ordain a man as a monk, but she would arrange to have other monks ordain one of our students, or some of our students, male students, as monks, but then they would, though they receive their ordination from monks, but then they stay at her monastery and they receive their guidance from her. And I know now in the Tibetan tradition there is the long-term American Tibetan Bhikshuni Tukten children in the state of Washington, Spokane, Washington. She has a male disciple who is a monk. Of course, he was ordained by other monks, but he stays under her for guidance. You know. <laughs> if information about that were to come back <laughs> to the Asian monastic commu communities of monks, Maybe the elder monks there would be thinking, what's happening to Buddhism in America? <laughs> yeah. Can I say a brief word in defense of Buddhism in America? Yeah. Um, <laughs> as far as uh, who goes first in the meal line, the way I've usually seen it done is two separate lines. Yeah. So monks in one line, nuns in one line, and they go simultaneously. Yeah. So it completely avoids the yeah, whole question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think by avoiding the whole question, we are denying the fact that these rules are based on the idea that the male gender is a superior gender. And I think it is good to, to address that fact, and even now in temples, yeah. nuns of like 20, 30 years yeah. sit in the back of the temple because women are inferior to the males. I mean, that is an yeah. established what, fact. You know, one thing I'll say in response to that, there is nothing that I've ever found in the canonical text that says that the female gender is inferior to the male gender, not in the text in the Pali canon. So this might be sort of a deeply ingrained cultural idea in Asian culture, but it's not 
a canonically endorsed idea. And in fact, probably the Buddha will say that it's not by reason of gender that a person is superior to another, but it's by reason of their qualities, their sila, samadhi, panya, or their sila, their sadha, sila, um, chaga, generosity, and panya, wisdom. Yeah, and it's also recent in the West yes. as well. I mean, exactly. it's really less than a century. Exactly. Yeah, no, I'm just saying it's important not to like deny that aspect. Women yeah. were essentially slaves, so let's so to not say that. Yeah. I think it's. I do think it's important to say it. You know, so it's like if we're talking about cultural, social strictures, we have to admit that that was for thousands of years, and it still is today, yeah. that women are were seen as inferior. I mean, even the Buddha said that I think there was in one sutta verses that women can't reach Buddhahood or something like that. I have an explanation of that, which it doesn't devolve on superiority and inferiority. I'll just give it briefly. That in India, in the Buddha's time, in different spheres of life, the authoritative figure was the male. And so we always have the kings, or the, the ruler of the country is the king. I don't think India ever had a powerful queen. Even China has had powerful empresses. But India, the power figure has always been the male, the king, up to the 20th century when Indira, Ga Indira Gandhi became Prime Minister. And she was really a powerful woman. And so the idea here is that the authoritative figure is the male. And so the Buddha is one who becomes the Dhamma Raja, the king of the Dhamma, the one who be be establishes the Dhamma and then becomes the ultimate authority over the Dhamma. So for that reason, He's male. It's not because the male is inherently superior to the female. Okay, now that I've entered into rather <laughs> <laughs> controversial yeah, ter territory. I didn't mean it. <laughs> Angry thoughts are starting to boil up. <laughs> we can end the day's activities with a short meditation <laughs> loving Turn off the um, the protection.